I guess if you want to, you can sit down. <laughs> Whew. Glory of the Lord. Wow. I would love to send a video of that to the governor of California. Because this is what I know. That when the Lion of Judah roars, he roars. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I'm not going to take much time um, because most of you didn't come here to see me. Um, and so... For those that were here last night, I know you were blessed. Um, as Dr. Mike Hutchings shared with us, the, the, some of the real amazing understanding of how trauma affects our lives. And then this morning, for those that were at the, look at that. You are tethered. <laughs> um, and then this morning, he did an amazing job of training. Uh, for those that weren't here last night um, and that you may be visiting More to Life for the first time, um, just a couple quick things that um, we're so glad you're here. We're so glad you chose to be here on a Saturday night when there was many possible other things to do. But we know that the creator of the universe has ordered this day for you to be here. Um, that That... It is not a surprise to him that you are here and that you are here for a purpose. Um, I would like to say that we, like I said, we are thrilled that you are here. And if you're part of another church in the, in the region or wherever, what our heart for you is this tonight, that you get such a touch from the Lord that you take it back and mess the whole place up. Just take it back and mess them up. If you're from the region and you don't have a local church, we would love for you to hang out with us. Um, but this isn't why we're here. But I want you to know that we're here. And so um, Dr. Mike Hutchings, I read his bio last night. Um, he has pastored in many, um, many contexts from Baptist to Vineyard to Mennonite, to, um, there was another one, wasn't there, Mike? Yeah, Willow Creek. Willow Creek. He, um, he's from Illinois. He is currently serving as the uh, Director of Education for the Ministry of Global Awakening, which is the ministry of Dr. Randy Clark. Um, he, um, he has multiple doctoral degrees. Um, 
and he's amazing. But I think my favorite thing about him is this. I love his laugh. I love his laugh. And I love that he's a good friend. So, uh, Mike, would you come up and, and share with us what the Lord's going to do in us tonight? I will. Thank you. So, uh, Pastors Rick and Pastor Lee, could I have you and your wives come up here, please, with me? I want you to stand right here and face this way towards me. Could I have some men up here with me, please? <clears throat> so, uh, just behind them, please, if you would, just men to be behind them. I'm not saying anything's going to happen, but you just never know. So, anyway. <laughs> yeah, okay, good, good, good. So, first of all, I just want to say what a pleasure and a joy it is. Bring me down. Can somebody bring me down a little bit? I feel a little, I feel a little hot right now. I feel really hot. That's better. Thank you. Um, it's a, this is the first, my first time to the Treasure Coast. This is my first visit here. And uh, I have loved, I've loved you guys anyway, but hanging out with you has even been such a greater joy for me. So I've got some things I want to give to you, and then I just want to pray over you. First of all, thank you for establishing a father's house here. Thank you that this is a house where sons and daughters can come and find who they really are in Jesus Christ. That this is a safe place. It's a place where people, there are, where sons and daughters are not going to be used for other religious agendas or to build a church or to build a foundation, but indeed to find the dream of God for their lives. And indeed, just a church, but it's a family. And I know that's your heart and desire is to really have a family where people can come, people who've not known what family looks like, and you show them what family in the kingdom of God really looks like which is very, very powerful. And it's what we desperately need in this moment of time in our society and what we desperately need in the church. Thank you for obeying the Holy Spirit because I know neither one of you were trained to do this. But you basically obeyed the Holy Spirit like I did with the PTSD stuff. And you followed him. And what that creates is instead of building an organization, which I know you guys are capable of doing, is that you've allowed Jesus to build an organism. And it's an organism that's a living thing. It's not something that is some kind of hierarchy or structure, but it's literally a living, breathing thing that's happening here. And because of that, what's happening is that people are waking up to the fact that although you've been that church in town, I told you this earlier, you've been that church in town that actually believes in speaking in tongues, actually believes in demons, it actually believes in healing. You put the words on the wall way from way back when and all that other stuff. The reality is that you are becoming that church that is becoming an apostolic hub for the Holy Spirit to come and really bring his glory in this region. What that means is that although you both have, you know, both of you couples are very powerful but what humility is, is allowing, and what humility and meekness is, is allowing the powerful people that you are to be submitted under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and allowing him to harness the power that is within you both personally as well as by the power of the Holy Spirit for him to use and release who you are in this church and into this community and into this region. And I do see you as an apostolic hub. And what that means is, is that you may never have more than two to 300 people in attendance on a Sunday or, sa or a Saturday night, but you're going to see thousands of people pour through this place. And they're going to come in, they're going to get equipped and trained because this is what an apostolic hub does. You equip, first of all, you get them saved, healed, delivered, you get them filled with the Holy Spirit, you get them to know their identity, you get them to know their gifts, and then you send them out, and you send them out throughout the rest of the world. And people will look at you and say, well, that's not a very big church. That's because you've learned, you've learned means that when God gives 
you the best, you also give your best away. Somebody can say amen to that besides one or two people. And that's what you guys do here. But what I'm saying to you tonight, and, and when you said that you had tingling in the back of your head, that was the Holy Spirit's signal to me. He's bringing a breaker anointing upon this church. It's coming with, you've had it, but it's coming with greater power and authority in the days ahead. You're going to see sons and daughters step into transformation faster and quicker than you have before. You're going to see people, you're going to see addictions, and you're going to see broken hearts, and you're going to see people's lives, you're going to see families restored, healed, and transformed in Jesus' name. And you're going to be sending apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers out into the church world. And they're going to have that Isaiah. The entire Isaiah 61 chapter is about taking the poor, the afflicted, the victimized, the traumatized, the marginalized, and then they get their identity, and then they go forth, and they restore the ruined cities, they repair the breaches, they take that which government and nobody else can do, and they bring transformation to cities and regions and whole countries in Jesus' name. So right now, just let the, the fire of God's already here. Stretch out your hands, guys. Let the fire of God come. Shana, I want to say this to you. There is healing anointing in your worship. And now you're going to take up a next step level. There's a next, this is an upgrade for you. This is an upgrade for you. That the Spirit of God is going to tell you that healing is going to come in worship. And you're going to declare that at the beginning of the worship. You're going to say, whatever you need to be healed of, whatever you need to be healed of in Jesus' name, God's going to heal you in the midst of worship. That people are not even going to have hands laid on them. They're just literally healed in the midst of worship. So in the name of Jesus, just declare an upcoming anointing right now in your worship in Jesus' name. Let the fire of God come in Jesus' name. Let the fire of God come in Jesus' name. Increase whatever grace and gifting and anointing is on my life, I give to you in Jesus' name. Fire of God for leadership. Both of you, come here. Both of you carry an amazing leadership anointing. It's very powerful in Jesus' name. And you are a son and a daughter who love other sons and daughters and bring in them to their place of identity in the kingdom. So let the fire of God fall right now in Jesus' name. Increase it. Increase it in Jesus' name. Fire of God fall in Jesus' name. More, Lord. Fire. 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 Increase every place the sole of your foot touches in this realm. I've given to you, says the Lord, in Jesus' name. And I've got one last thing. This is I, it keeps coming back to me, and I can't, I can't let go of this picture. So Joshua and the children of Israel step across the Jordan River, and they come into their promised land. But what their promised land looks like is that it is, it is covered with people who are demon-possessed, who worship idols that sacrifice their children to fire, and it is a horribly polluted land. But as they walk into the promised land, God says, this is yours. This is what I promised your father Abraham. Every place their foot goes literally is transformed by the power that is within them. And they take a polluted land and make it a paradise. They take a polluted land that cannot crops and they make it a beautiful garden. They take a polluted land that was full of sin and degradation, and awful, awful, horrible, evil things, a dark land, and they transform it to a land of light, and glory, and provision, and the blessing of God, so that some three or four hundred years later, Solomon has a reign in Israel as the king, that all the kings of the earth are looking at Solomon and they are envying him because of the beauty and the glory and the majesty that has become Israel. And I say to the four of you in Jesus' name that that's what you guys do. You take that which was polluted and degraded and destroyed and you bring back the dream of God for it and you let things, you make things grow. You make things prosper. You see the dream of God for people's lives and you restore it in Jesus' name. So come on, praise God, will you? Give thanks to God. Thank you, gentlemen.
I appreciate it. Bless you. More, Lord. More, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, it's so great to be here again. How many of you were not here the last two days? How many of you are not here? Raise your hands. Okay, a few of you. Well, it's great to have you here tonight. For those of you that have stuck around and been here all weekend, I really appreciate you being here. It's really awesome. So, um, my name is Mike, and uh, I'm a boy from Illinois. I originally come from Illinois, from the Peoria area. I met some amazing people. These folks, stand up, you guys. These guys are were in the Peoria area. Uh, when I was there, as a matter of fact, we never knew each other, but we all know the same people, which is awesome. I love that. Uh, for those of you that have not been here uh, over the last couple days, uh, the amazing Jason, everybody say amazing Jason, is just doing a fantastic job in uh, stewarding my resource table. This is my brand new book that just came out two weeks ago, and it's all on the Healing Trauma Seminar. And lots of, I know that the booklet has been sold out, but this book actually contains the booklet. So all of the prayers for the healing trauma are in this book, and you can get that. It has some of my story. It, it just has a lot of stuff on freedom that's available. This is the DVD and the CD on the Healing Trauma Seminar, Developing a Kingdom Mindset, which is the very first teaching that I give at, uh, at Global School of Supernatural Ministry. Um, a number of you have asked about this this CD, and I'm just going to tell you about it real quick, not to sell it, but to give some hope to people. This is the CD teaches about what the real definition of freedom is. And I'll go ahead and tell you what it is. The biblical definition of freedom is freedom is the ability to respond to God the way that he originally created me to be and to do that all God has purposed me to do. That's real freedom. I tell the story about how um, I come from a, a, a family where my dad uh, was one of three children. He was the youngest. And my grandfather, who died when my dad was 11, was the youngest of 13 children. And of those 13 children in the Hutchins family, my grandfather was the only one that had children. Now watch this. I was an only child, and my parents were told that they were not going to have kids after eight years. And then I, I came along right? No accident. But what I experienced as a child in terms of the thoughts that were in my mind, the things that would come into my room at night and disturb me and bother me that now I understand were demons and were part of the generational stuff that was in my family, uh, they really made me wonder if I was really sane or not as a, as a young person. Um, somebody a few years ago uh, gave me a, a subscription to Ancestry.com. Anybody been on Ancestry.com, a few of us? How many of you know that when you start going up the family tree and start shaking a little bit, you better watch out because you never know what fruits and nuts are going to fall out, right? <laughs> so what I discovered, and I knew this before, that my grandfather died in an alcoholic institution in Central City, Kentucky in 1933. I didn't, nobody ever said anything about my great aunts and uncles, which were all his brothers and sisters. But of the 12 other children, that by the way, none of them had children. Three of them died of suicide. Three more of them died in insane asylums. Two others died of alcoholism. And two others died of cancer. There's this whole lineage of generational curses that was part of the Hutchings family legacy. And it all kind of came on me. And what I came to realize is that so many of the things that I struggled with as a child, you know, there, there were addictions, there were all sorts of things. And even as a, as a young adult, I realized that yes, they were my responsibility but they were also because of the generational curses that were in my life. And so this deals with, it doesn't go into lots of uh, in-depth, but it teaches that no matter what the legacy of your family is, whether it's righteous or whether it's evil, you can be free of that in Jesus' name. And the bloodline can stop with you so, so that it doesn't affect your children or your grandchildren in any way, shape, or form. That's the message of the CD. So 
Yeah, amen. I, I agree with that. The last thing I just want to let you know, I have a great friend. His name is Dale Mass. As a matter of fact, I'm going to recommend that at some point, uh, Pastors Lee and Rick bring him down here. He's an incredible prophet. He comes and teaches at our Global School of Supernatural Ministry. But his most recent book is Shattering the Limitations of Pain, Identity Restoration for a Life of More Like Jabez. You know that there's a guy named Jabez in the Old Testament that prayed a prayer. And because his mother named him Jabez, which was the name of Jabez was giver of pain. He prayed that God would make it so that he would not be somebody who gave pain, but instead that God would bless him. And it says, and God answered his prayer. So I want to say to you, and this is where we're going to go tonight. I want to talk with you about your identity. I want you to understand the war against your identity tonight. And I want you to be very clear about something that God has always had a dream for your life. Um, by the way, for those of you that are, are not aware of this, uh, while I work for Global Awakening, I also have a website called GodHealsPTSD.com. GodHealsPTSD.com. And it is where you can find resources. You can find my schedule. Uh, I'm blessed to be able to, when I, while I work for Global Awakening, I go out on weekends and, and in churches like this. I go to military bases. I have an assignment with the Navajo Nation that I've actually been to the Navajo Nation and taught the president, vice president, and executive council, as well as the pastors of the Navajo Nation about healing from trauma. I have an assignment to go to the Crow Nation uh, in, the, in the northwest of our uh, country uh, this coming year. And I also have an assignment to go to Rwanda. I'm gonna be going to Rwanda with a team of people next year. And we're gonna be doing stadium events of 30 to 50,000 people and breaking the power of the spirit of trauma off of that nation and, and just declaring healing with a group of Catholic priests, by the way, with a group of Catholic priests. So somebody praise God, will you? So all of that, all that will be on God Heals PTSD and you can take a look at that. So turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter eight. Hallelujah, Jesus. It's already really good in here. I don't know how much I can add to it, but we'll try. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8. So, for those of you who have not been here, come on in, brother. Welcome. Come on down to the front. Come and have a seat right here. Would you welcome Dr. David Thompson? Come on, this amazing man of God. We bless you. Yeah, sit right there. Sit right there. Great. So glad you came back. We're blessed by you. You know what? I... Um, Thank you for coming back. And can I just give you a word real quick? Stand up if you would, brother. Extend your hands out to this, brother. Brother, I want to say to you that your greatest days of ministry are yet ahead of you. There's an anointing for freedom that's on your life. That Isaiah 61 is a chapter that is very near and dear to your heart. Because you've given your life to the broken because you've given your life to the imprisoned, because you've given your life to the outcast and the marginalized. Jesus says, he's proud of you, son. He's proud of you in the way that you have behind the scenes for all these years, simply sought to serve Jesus in ministering to those that the church would not minister to. I see you raising up sons and daughters that are gonna be your legacy in this region to continue to expand this ministry of bringing healing and restoration to people who are in the worst possible scenarios. They're in addiction centers, they're in, they're in prisons, they're in jails, they're in shelters, they're in all sorts of different places. And I'm saying to you that in the days ahead, you're going to see a multiplication of what you do. I, I, don't, I think you've got curriculum written and all that other stuff, but I see you training people and really raising up disciples that are going, going to go after this and really, this area is going to be known as a place of wholeness and healing. And you're going to be a big part of that. So we bless you, Dr. David Thompson, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So, in Jeremiah chapter 1, you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to quote it to you. Jeremiah chapter 1 is calling Jeremiah. And he's calling him to do his ministry. And Jeremiah is reluctant. He... 
He does, he's not sure he wants this call. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the voice of the Lord or if God's ever called you and you've been like, yeah, I'd rather not. But you know what? That's, that happens with people sometimes. They do that. You know, we would think if God calls us, we'd say yes. But how many of you know that Jeremiah was not called to an easy ministry? Have you read the book of Jeremiah lately? How many of you know that he not only was he in the book of Jeremiah, but he also wrote the book of Lamentations. He was known as the weeping prophet because of the assignment that he had been given. But God spoke to him. I, I have a feeling that Jeremiah was the type of young man that was not secure in his identity. He wasn't sure if he was really hearing God, and he really wasn't secure in everything about him. And this is what God said to Jeremiah. Before you were knit together in your mother's womb, I knew you. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because you and I, I said this earlier in the seminar, but I'm going to say it again. That if you're in this room tonight, if you're watching this on the broadcast, I always like to say if you're on this side of the soil and you're still sucking oxygen, then you have a purpose that God has a dream for your life. That God created you with a dream for your life. And God never gives up on that dream. Somebody can say amen to that, can't you? You need to understand something. God is so committed to seeing the dream that he created you for to be fulfilled that that's why he sent Jesus Christ. Do you understand that God had a dream for this entire earth and he was going to use Adam and Eve, the first son and daughter that he created to literally multiply their experience in Eden throughout the entire earth? But as you, as you know the story, that they listened to a lie from the enemy who was jealous of who they were, and they bought the lie. And they stepped out of fellowship with the one who created them that was the source of all life and all authority. They stepped out of that place. And when they stepped out of that place, the enemy was given authority to step into this world and to bring everything that makes life miserable in this world. Hatred, racism, famines, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, any kind of disease, any kind of demonic activity, any kind of mental illness, any kind of wars, any kind of destruction, all of that came not because God likes to destroy things, but because the enemy loves to destroy the dream of God for everything that God creates. So you need to understand, first and foremost, that although God created you with a dream, you also have been living in a world that's a war zone. How many of you know that you woke up this morning in a war zone? And that what that war zone is, is the advancing of the kingdom of God that began when Jesus came on this earth and he declared, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And what that war looks like is that God, Jesus raising up disciples to take back everything that the enemy has stolen from the dream of God for humankind and for this earth. That indeed when Jesus said in John chapter 10 verse 10, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The abundant life, he wasn't talking about abundant life in heaven. He was talking about abundant life right here on earth right now. You know, I, you know, first of all, I, I grew up Baptist. Any Baptists in the room? Anybody grew up Baptist? So I grew up Baptist and we spiritualized everything in the Bible. We we spiritualized all the promises. And what we said was, well, anything that was positive, you know, anything that was good, anything that was about the kingdom, we put off to the millennium, like to when Jesus comes back, right? That, I mean, that was, we were told we really couldn't hope in any really exciting things right now because we're waiting for Jesus to take us home. Jesus, come on, take us home. You know, we used to do rapture drills, you know, we used to jump up and down and we used to do rapture practice and what have you. I mean, crazy stuff. But the reality is, is that everything that Jesus experienced, everything that the disciples experienced, everything that they were able to do and see 
and accomplish is still available for you and I today. You see, there's no scripture in the Bible that says, well, God only used it for the first hundred years of the church. Then after that, it all went away. The reality is, is that everything you see Jesus do, whether he heals the sick, whether he casts out demons, whether he cleanses lepers, whether he raises the dead, whether he multiplies food, whether he stills the storm, everything that Jesus is doing is that he's showing his disciples what it looks like to take back control of this earth from the powers of darkness. Jesus said to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, he said, Peter confessed that he was Jesus Christ, the true, the true Son of God. And Jesus says, on the basis of this revelation, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Now, what, is that, what do the keys of the kingdom look like? What it looks like, it looks like humankind actually being restored to the kind of authority, to the kind of power, and to the kind of provision that Adam and Eve had all the way back in the garden. As a matter of fact, how many of you have listened to my message, Developing a Kingdom Mindset? Anybody? So you know in a kingdom mindset, I talk about, it says in, in the book of Revelation, that when Jesus rises from the dead, he takes the keys that run this earth back from Satan. You know, it's like, you know, I've, if I have a car and I, I, I lend my keys to my brother David here, and he takes the car, and he wouldn't do this, but you know he kind of treats the car really bad, and he brings it back to me. And while he is controlling the car for a little bit because he has the keys, the reality is that I still own the car. And see, what Satan has done all these years is he took the authority from humankind, and he took the keys of the operation of this world, and he's tried to destroy it as much as he possibly can. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he says he took the keys of death and hell. He took the keys of the kingdom. And it literally says that in Revelation, he says, I now have the keys and I now give them to my church. My church now has the keys to absolutely bring the kingdom of God back into this earth. And what is the kingdom of God? It's the rule and reign and the power of the love of God, restoring the dream of God to all of humankind. Could I get an agreement in the room, anybody? So in the midst of that, you need to understand that in your life, you woke up in a war zone. And that war zone is the kingdom of God advancing against the kingdom of darkness. You know, when, the, when my dad, Clarence Hutchings, was in the second wave of troops that came onto the beaches of Normandy after D-Day. And historians will tell you in World War II that when the, the Allied troops went into Europe, that was the day that Hitler and the Nazi regime's back was broken. But that was in June of 1944. And it wasn't until 1945 that VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, was finally commenced and Germany surrendered. And there was more fighting and there were more lives lost in, the, in that year than in any other year of the war, in the entire war combined, simply because of the, of the intensity of the warfare that was happening in Europe against the, against the German army. Guys, you and I live between the cross and the resurrection and the second coming of Jesus. And in the midst of that, it is our job as the church of Jesus Christ to prevail against the gates of hell in this world. And that's what this church is all about. It's about literally raising up sons and daughters who will not be intimidated, who will not be dominated, who will not be manipulated by the powers of darkness or be concerned that somehow the darkness is too great for us. Because Jesus said, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon the rock of Revelation, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. In other words, we don't have to be defensive 
against the powers of darkness. We are on offense. Brothers and sisters, I know things look kind of tough right now in our country, but I'm telling you, the devil is doing his best to show his worst cards. And I'm saying to you that you and I have nothing to fear. The reason why he's bringing out his big guns is because he knows that the church of Jesus Christ is getting ready to bring in the largest harvest of souls that this earth has ever seen. Do you understand that when those 11 men stood before Jesus and he gave them the great commission, he told them to go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, teaching them to do everything they observed to do, that, that Jesus taught them to do. And the world that they were looking at was in estimation, by historical estimation, there was about 205 million people living on the earth at that time. Do you understand we have over 330 million people just living in America right now? Do you understand that by the end of 2021, there will be over 8 billion people on this planet? Now think about this. You and I have the greatest privilege in all of human history to populate heaven with more people than any other generation of people that has ever existed. We have the most revelation that is being poured out by the Holy Spirit. We have the more anointing that is being, the Holy Spirit is touching throughout the world. We have more teaching that is available to us right now. We see more of the glory of God falling on other countries like Iran and Afghanistan and Iraq and Turkey where people are coming by the droves into the kingdom of God. You and I live in the greatest day that's ever been to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Right here and now, today. What does that mean for you and me? What that means for you and me? Is it time for us to get healed? It's time to us to get filled? It's time to us to get completely delivered of whatever demon is still bothering you and to step into the assignment of the call of God on your life. That the reality is, is that God never calls the qualified. He always qualifies the call. And all he's looking for, he's not looking for people who are qualified. He's looking for people who are available. Now here's what the enemy, this is where we veer into trauma now. Trauma are all those bad things that have happened to you your whole life. It's as we talked about trauma, literally the, mean, the, the, the word means wound. What happens when you experience trauma, whether you were a child, whether you were a young adult, or whether you've experienced trauma throughout your whole life, what that trauma does, those traumatic events that happen to you do, is they shatter your soul. They, your soul consists of your mind, the way you think, your will, the way you choose, your emotions, the way you feel. And, they, and it also, the fourth part, is your identity, who you are. And what the enemy seeks to tell you, what he seeks to steal, kill, and destroy through those traumatic events, is he seeks to somehow tell you that because all this bad stuff happens to you, God doesn't love you. He doesn't care for you. God, you're, you're like a redheaded stepchild that is left behind the door someplace. That God somehow is punishing you or is trying to teach you a lesson through all this bad stuff. And that's what the enemy lies to you. This is what God says to you. Yes, my son and daughter, you're going to go through suffering, but the suffering leads to a greater glory. That indeed, your identity is not as a victim or somebody who is traumatized victimized or marginalized but indeed your identity is as a royal son or daughter in whom he is well pleased look with me in romans chapter 8 if anybody ever wants to know what the definition of a son or daughter is i'm going to give it to you right now in verse 12 of romans chapter 8 it says this therefore brethren we are debtors not to the flesh 
to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And then you can underline verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now, ladies, everybody look at me. Just because it says sons, don't get freaked out here. We, are, we men get called the bride of Christ. So it all kind of evens out, okay? It's, it's all okay. <clears throat> Verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? For the creation was subjected to futility. Now we're talking about the fall here. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruit of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps uh, in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot even be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things, say all things, work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore it is also is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now here it get, now it gets really good, guys. Who shall separate us from the love of God, of love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written. For your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Somebody shout, will you? You know who writes these, these things here? It's the Apostle Paul. 
He writes it by his inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But let me, you don't have to turn there, but I want to just take you to a quick passage of Scripture. You wonder if Paul knows what he's talking about, right? You wonder, what, what, what's Paul saying in all this? Does, does he really know what he's talking about? So how many of you know that Paul was called by God? He was encountered on the road to Damascus, and he was the Jew of Jews. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. And he was, he was literally called by God not to be an evangelist to his own people, but he was sent as an evangelist to the Gentiles. And, and so how many of you know, maybe he didn't want that assignment at first. Anybody know that? Can you kind of get that idea a little bit? But he was sent and as an evangelist to the Gentiles. And Paul suffered. Paul suffered for his call. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is having to defend his apostleship from the very church that he planted. There had been some guys that had come through that called themselves the super apostles. Let me say this to you. You hear anybody call themselves a super apostle, don't listen to a word that they say. You know, just kind of, you know, if I got super apostle on my business card, that's, that's not a good thing. That's coming in a superhero costume, you know, type of thing. Super apostle! Yeah, I'd say, no, no th thanks, no thanks, bless you. But Paul is having to defend himself. And then he has to go and he has to talk about the things that he has done and the things that have happened to him in his pursuit of the calling of God in his life. And in verse 20, he, he's talking about these people that are coming as super apostles. And he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes, that is in scourgings above measure. In prisons more frequently. In deaths often. From the Jews five times, I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false, false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things which come upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak if I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? But if I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas the king was guarding the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Now, why am I reading this to you tonight? I'm reading this to you to understand this. All the trauma that you've been through in your life is not because you're somebody that God likes to punish. It's not because God somehow abandoned you. It's not because that that something is bad about you, which is shame, that somehow deserves to just have all these bad things happen to you. If Paul thought that, he probably would have committed suicide a long time ago. You know, there's some biblical scholars that believe that, you know when Paul talks about being taken to the third heaven, how, remember, how many of you remember that? They believe that actually during one of these things that happened with him, that Paul actually died. And that he went to heaven, that he was sent back. We, we've heard those stories before. But here's what the enemy does. The enemy has a war against the dream of God for your life. He is out to steal, to kill, and destroy every bit of purpose that God has for you. And when we have been traumatized, 
it's interesting how we like to join in with that lie. And so we do lots of things out of our own pain that we call sin, that we call activity that is, that is not helpful to us or the people around us. And there are things, and you can name, name any of them. One of the big things that people get involved with is addictions. And they get involved in addictions because they're trying to medicate their own pain. And because of medicating your own pain, you do lots of things that you would never do with a, with a clear mind, with a straight mind. It doesn't take away the responsibility for what we do, but we need to understand something. So much of, of the struggle that we've had in living the kind of dream that God has for us is simply believing the lie of the enemy, that the good life, the abundant life, is actually not available for us because there's something bad in us. And I want to say to you tonight, my friends, that's a lie. I want to say to you tonight that you were not chosen to be somebody who lives a life so traumatized, so much in pain all the time that you can't understand what the abundant life is. I want to declare to you tonight in Jesus' name that the very purpose and dream of God for, for your life is that you experience the power of his love, that you understand the joy of walking in fellowship with him, that you understand that once you welcome Jesus Christ into your life and the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you, that you have the same spirit that raised Jesus' dead body from the grave living in you, and that he never, ever leaves. You may feel like God is distant from you, but your feelings lie to you. Turn to somebody and say, my feelings lie to me. Turn to somebody and say that. I guarantee that every, just about every negative feeling you've ever had, most of them anyway, have lied to you. They try to get you in a place when you become depressed, discouraged, you seek to walk away from God, you feel like God has abandoned you. And I'm saying to you that if you welcome Jesus Christ into your life, whatever time that was, God has never forsaken you. He's never abandoned you. You're his temple. You, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And the same spirit that raised Jesus' dead body from the grave lives in you. So therefore, you have nothing to fear. This is why Paul can confidently state in Romans chapter 8 that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There is nothing. The only thing that can possibly make us think that is by listening to the lie of the devil. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. What that means is that nobody else has authority on this earth. Now we talk all the time about how powerful the powers of darkness are. And how dark things are. And the power of the devil and all of the other stuff. I want to let you know something. The only power that the enemy has in your life. Is when you listen to one of his lies. The only authority that any demon has in your life. Is when you listen to the lies of that demon. And believing that lie becomes a landing strip for that demon. To continue to influence you. To lie to you to make you influenced by that darkness and you think that somehow that you have no authority over that thing, that you just got to listen to that thing for the rest of your life. And I'm saying to you that Jesus Christ has given you authority. It's said in Luke chapter 4, 10, verse 19, when the disciples came back from their mission trip of healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons, and declaring the gospel of the kingdom, they said, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he says, I have given you power and authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm you. Now here's the deal, guys. They weren't filled with the Spirit yet. They were ministering only under the authority of the name of Jesus. Guess what? We got it better. 
Come on, somebody. We got it better. We not only have the name of Jesus, we not only have the permission and authority of Jesus, but we have his spirit in us, with us, all the time. So therefore, no matter what trauma has happened to you, no matter how you've been abused, used, no matter what has gone on in your life, you need to understand that it's never been part of the dream of God for your life. That indeed there has been a war over your identity for your entire life. And it's a war over the dream of God. And it's time that first of all, you let go of all that stuff. See, we can let that stuff stay close to us by holding on to it. See, we like to, how many of you know we like to punish ourselves? How many of you know that there are many people in this room that actually you hate yourself? You can't look at yourself in the mirror and love that person on the other side. Because you are your own worst critic. Now watch this. See, you have an experience with yourself that's traumatic. Right? How many of you relate to what I just said? You have an experience with yourself that's traumatic. You've disappointed yourself. You've made some really stupid choices in your life. You've even made some evil choices in your life in the past. And it's hard for you to let go of that and actually forgive you. When if you've welcomed Jesus Christ into your life, God's already forgiven you, and it's as if it never happened. Somebody's going to get this in a minute. See, when you keep accusing yourself and hating yourself for your past choices, what you're doing is you're actually allowing the enemy to continue to discourage you, to continue to oppress you, to continue to just continue to wail on you so much so that it's hard for you to understand that your father doesn't have those thoughts about you at all. As a matter of fact, the word of God says many are the thoughts that your father has about you and they're all good. And so it's time that you start loving that person on the other side of the mirror. It's time you look at them and you say to them, and this is what I had to do. I was my own worst critic. And I, I, I felt bad about a lot of the things that I had done, even though I had asked forgiveness from God. And I'd asked forgiveness of the people I'd done it for. But I still had disappointed myself. And it's, at some point, I looked myself in the mirror. And by the Holy Spirit, I asked this question. Father, would you help me to love the person in the mirror the way you love them? See, I want to learn how to love me the way the Father loves me. He knows everything about me. He knows every thought I've ever had. And he still loves me. <laughs> Somebody praise God with that, will you? And if you understand that, then you understand that nothing can ever separate you from the love of Christ. That indeed, as a son or a daughter, you no longer are in bondage to slavery that leads to fear. But now you are free to be the amazing son or daughter that God always dreamed for you. So tonight, here's what we want to do. We've, we're going to ask Holy Spirit to come and manifest himself in this room to bring freedom and healing to your trauma. We're going to have a team of people that were trained this morning about how to pray for folks and minister to them. But I'm going to pray for you corporately first. But I want you to know something. Tonight, you can walk out of here and every single chain that has you bound from a history of trauma, from a history of sin, and from a history of fear can be broken off of you tonight in Jesus' name. You don't have to go through some process of that chain breaking. Jesus came to set the captives free. He came to open the prison doors and to let prisoners come out. He's come to heal your broken heart and restore the fullness of the dream of God for you. How many of you say you want that tonight? Anybody in the room? The Holy Spirit come in power right now. Now, everybody that was part of the seminar learns this. 
that when my catching is praised for you, you've got to keep your eyes open. Because I like eye contact. So I want you to keep your eyes open while I pray for you. I want you to take your right hand. I want you to put it right here. Come in power, Holy Spirit, right now in Jesus' name. Tonight is a life-changing moment for you. You may have been a, a believer in Christ for decades, but you've never stepped fully into the dream of God for your life. You've, you've carried things from your past. You've carried wounds from the past. You've carried all the lies, the lids, and the labels that have put on you for decades. And you've never walked in true freedom. But I want you to say this with me. Everybody look at me. I want you to say this with me. Because of Jesus, I am no longer defined by my history, by what I have done, by what others have done to me, by the things that I have witnessed, or by my family. I am now defined by who my Father calls me. He calls me His beloved child, in whom He is well pleased. Therefore, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I have a sound mind because I have the mind of Christ. Therefore, I think God's thoughts and I'm not going crazy. So in Jesus' name, come in power right now, Lord. I break the power of every spirit of trauma every spirit of torment, every spirit of fear. In the name of Jesus, I sever the assignment of the spirit of suicide. There's somebody in this room that's been thinking, you've been getting lies about taking your life. And I'm saying to you, those come from a spirit, they come from a demon spirit that's trying to stop the dream of God. So I sever in Jesus' name. Every lie of the spirit of suicide in Jesus' name. I also, in the name of Jesus, I sever the spirit of addiction. I sever the spirit of death that's over many people in this room. That you have literally dark things show up in your room at night. And they terrorize you. And in the name of Jesus, I declare the same spirit that raised Jesus' dead body from the grave lives in you. Therefore, you can tell that spirit of death to leave you alone and to quit tormenting you anymore in Jesus' name. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask you to come and you bring healing to these souls in this room. I pray you heal their minds. I pray you heal their wills. I pray you restore their emotions back to the right balance in Jesus' name. And Father, that they would step in to an understanding of the real dream that you've had for every person in this room and restore the, their identity back to your original design in Jesus' name. Father, I ask you to come and fill every person with your Holy Spirit where trauma has occupied and break every single chain that holds on, holds them to their past. And I declare freedom. I declare freedom. I declare freedom. I declare freedom. In Jesus' name.